The Victory Garden, Chapter 6 Andy Jones sank to the sidewalk, cross-legged, and draped his wrists over his folded knees. I don't know, he said. This is huge. The kids had come, sure enough, on Thursday after school. Andy wasn't the only one with the long face. Yeah, is it a garden or a farm? Where do we start? My dad will show us, I said. But first we have to have a plan. I held up a tablet and pencil. We managed to agree on three things. I listed them and made a five-line star in front of each one. Work Thursdays after school till summer. Work Saturdays now and all summer. Pick, sell, and deliver. Andy added a fourth. No adults allowed except for advice. That way, they'll be dying to help us, he said. Do we sign in blood? Yeah, yours, said Rich. Scott hung around after the others left. He seemed to have something to say that he didn't want everyone to hear. He still held the hoe, shifting it from hand to hand. Heard from your dad? I asked, not knowing what else to say. Not in a while, he said. I felt like we had suddenly become the adults. How's your mother doing? It was my way of asking how Scott was doing, how they were all holding up. It was the same thing people asked me sometimes. Good, I guess. She's making a garden too, her first one. I think she dreaded it at the beginning, but she said since the baby was older now, she should do it like everyone else. To bring the boys home sooner? And the men. I swallowed, embarrassed by my blunder. It was hard enough to have a brother gone. What must it be like for Scott? Some folks don't understand that. What? That my dad left. He scratched a line in the dirt with the hoe. But he's serving his country. The whole town's proud of him. Some, not all. People say things. What people? The old maid, for one. Theta Buell? Foo. Nobody listens to her. Maybe you're right. Maybe people just don't know what to say. They kind of hush up when we come around. Or they talk low, like they don't know what, like they don't know I'm listening. Same here. People talk to my mother while I'm standing right there. Of course, Teresa is so much younger. As if I don't miss Jeff because, just because there aren't any others between him and me. I miss him more that way. I'm the only kid at home now. I know. Scott gripped the hose handle with both hands and finally said what was on his mind. Sometimes I won't be able to come. When one of the little kids gets sick, I take care of the others. If mom gets sick, I take care of them all. Who would be ashamed of that, I wondered. He must have read the question in my look. I'm not sure the guys would understand, he said. Probably they wouldn't, I thought as he pedaled away on his bike. Not many boys become man of the house before they're through being boys. Maria and Ellie helped with little kids too. All the boys had yards to mow. I had only to keep the living room straight and help with the cooking and dishes. If the war had made Scott a man of the house, it had made me an only child for now. I drew in a huge breath. This garden would be mostly up to me. At home, mother sat at the sewing machine, leaning over a swath of purple checks. One more sleeve to set in, she said. You'll look nice in this. I was eager for it to be, fr to be finished. A new school dress so late in the year was unusual, but my old ones were patched, faded, and way up past my knees. Mother did her sewing and scraps of time trimmed out of the late afternoon, after work, and before supper. She said sewing wasn't work, it was sitting down. I believed her. She had a contented look just then. I thought perhaps I shouldn't disturb her mood, but I had something on my mind. Have you ever heard anything bad about Mr. Walker, Scott's dad? Bad? Like what? Like something about his being in the army away from his family? Well, just that. But who are others to say that's bad? It's between him and his family. Then people do talk? Oh, honey, there are always people who talk, but not many. Scott Sr. is a fine man who loves his family enough to help keep our country safe for them. What most people say is that both he and Mrs. Walker are very brave and patriotic. Scott's brave too. Mother reached for my hand. So are you, Teresa. I didn't see how, but I squeezed her hand. I looked around at the room, Jeff's old room, 
The sewing machine now stood on the desk that had seen piles of math papers and model airplane parts. I used to watch him cut the sofa, balsa wood, and fit wings to fuselage, covering it all with tissue paper. He had mounted a B-24 on one wall, a great plane with a four-foot wingspan. I'm going to fly a real one of, I'm going to fly a real one. A, sorry. I'm going to fly a real one, one of the, of these someday, he had told me. His bicycle stood in the very spot where, where he had left it. No one had the heart to move it, even the dust mop under its wheels. I saw myself on the handlebars, waving my arms like the prop for his plane, and tears started running down my face. Not so brave, I said, and wiped my nose on my arm. Mother snipped the thread from a finished seam. She held the dress up to me, then gathered it and me into her arms. God gave us tears, she said. Sometimes they help to keep us brave. I couldn't imagine Mother crying, but at her words I snuggled in. Friday was another fidgety day. I dashed home from school, just in case Mrs. Burt called early with Mr. Burt's answer. The night before, when we had phoned to ask about Mr. Burt and to see whether we could keep the garden, she had said, He's doing all right, but he'll be here a long time. I'm just not sure how he'll feel about the garden. I better call you back. If only I could talk to Jeff. I checked the mailbox by the front door, hoping, hoping. It was there. A letter from Jeff, addressed to all of us in Jeff's familiar scrawl. Mr. and Mrs. Alan Marks and Teresa. That meant I could open it without waiting. It's been a long time since I've written, Jeff began. It sure had been. Our letters often crossed in the mail. So he didn't know about Mr. Burt yet. Dad, thanks for telling me about the map a while back. Save it for me. I read the Army Times when I can get it, but I can't keep it. I can't keep up with everything like we used to. Don't worry about me, except for missing all of you. I'm fine. Flying is hard work, but it beats anything else. Then came a special word to each of us. To me, he wrote, Well, Squirt, I guess you're tall enough to ride my bike now. Ask Dad to lower the seat. Don't skin up on his trees. I laughed at that. He had once crashed into a slender Chinese elm that Dad had just planted. As Jeff told it, the tree got more sympathy than he did. I dashed upstairs and changed out of my school dress into my overalls, then went into Jeff's room. It smelled of mother's talcum powder now, instead of wood and airplane glue. The bicycle leaned on its kickstand, dust gathered under its tires. I closed my fingers around the handlebars, eased the stand up with my foot, and stretched one leg over the crossbar. Yes, dad would need to lower the seat but I was tall enough. I wanted to ride it at once, only the tires needed air and the seat was too high. Plus, I was waiting for Mrs. Burt's call. So when the telephone rang downstairs, I scrambled off the bike and bounded down. It was for me, but it wasn't Mrs. Burt. It was Louise Lang dropping out. It's going to be too much work, she whined, and my family already buys bonds. She's spoiled, I told mother that night as we fixed supper. Perhaps. What about the others? Will they stay? I didn't have an answer yet. The next call brought worse news, much worse. It came while we were eating. Wait a few days, I heard my mother say into the phone. He may come back. Let's not tell the Burt's just yet. Old Wolf had run away from the Burt's relatives just days after they had come for him. I was edgy, waiting for Mrs. Burt to call. I picked up my supper and studied the telephone on the wall. Brown wooden box with black crank, mouthpiece and receiver on its hook. It seemed to bring only bad news. Did I really want it to ring? When it did, later, I answered nervously. We were in the workroom putting air in the bicycle tires with Jeff's old tire pump. This time it was Mrs. Burt calling. At least we would get it settled. Either we could do the garden or we couldn't. I blurted out an awkward, how's Mr. Burt? They're taking good care of him, dear, she said. He says it's okay for you to take over the garden, on one condition. You have to beat Alan Marks in the tomato duel. I blew out a long breath, then I laughed. Can I come live with you if we do? When I told Dad, he grinned and said, impossible. Impossible you would let me move? 
Impossible, you'll beat me, he said. He screwed the cap back on the tire stem. I shoved my hands into my overall pockets and made myself tall and gruff. We'll just see about that, Alan Marks. That was how I took over more than an old man's garden. I took over his campaign to help my father get through the war.